I'm Nelly Pokiak, I'm from Takchiak Tuk, and I'm just going to demonstrate to you what uh, my community used to look like when I was growing up as a child. And there's a lot of differences now because there's a lot of erosion that occurred. Not only that, um, we've been able to see the transformation from living a traditional lifestyle to working with science. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. But if you look, as a child growing up, the ocean was, there are a lot of beaches and a lot of sand. Out here there was a curling rink and I lived on the other side of it. There was three buildings that used to be on the, our street. Now there's only one because of the erosion. And further down here there was a big beach and I used to swim on this beach. Now there's big boulders just to prevent it from erosion. And there was a place over here where the RCMP used to have their um, detachment and the, um, where they incarcerated people. Now that's been gone. And so to me, there's been a lot of differences that I've seen over the years growing up as a child in Tuck. There's a whole range of issues changing weather patterns, changing precipitation patterns, um, more snow or more rain in uh, times where there used to be more snow and um, thinner ice, faster breakup of ice in the springtime, uh, later freeze up in the fall. Uh, these are all issues that northern communities are facing. When you scale that up and you look at the whole Beaufort Sea, the whole Beaufort Sea has been losing sea ice at an amazing rate. The amount of sea ice is shrinking towards the, towards the pole and it looks like it's actually going to um, pass the pole this year and be only isolated to the Canadian archipelago side, northern Greenland side. So we're expecting the multi-year ice to retreat even past the pole this year. So we may have a ice-free North Pole this summer. You know, climate change is something that we have really no control over. I mean, it's really the uh, world community that has to come to terms with uh, how much greenhouse gases are being emitted into our atmosphere and how all this is changing, uh, how our winters are acting in the Arctic, because the Arctic is like the, the sink where all these changes and all these contaminants come to and it's the currents and the winds that are causing this and this is what we've learned from scientists which is good to know. When I was a young girl we had a house behind the Catholic Church in a little log house and I spent most of my time playing around here but also playing on the beach on on this side so I spent a lot of time um, making fires and swimming out in the ocean. So this is a point area of Tuk 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 or Tuk 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 maybe uh, underwater in the next 10 or 20 years because it's at sea level so if the sea level rises then they're going to be in real trouble. Yes, climate is very important to us because it affects up how we our lifestyle is changing. Not only that it affects how um, our food is harvested so sometimes we tend to get our beluga whale at the beginning of July but now it's so hot that we have to wait till it cools off. And then sometimes we don't get any beluga whales because of the weather change, because the winds come up. So environmental concerns have always been uppermost in our minds because we live off the land. We depend on the environment. We depend on, the, on good weather and being, being able to predict when the seasons are changing and being able to predict when the weather is going to change because there are ways of knowing how the weather, weather is going to change. I, I was taught that when I was growing up as well, you know. But life has really changed over the years. Today we have technology, we've got computers, we have running water, we have um, furnaces. Long ago we used to have wood and ha get ice and snow for water and har we harvested a lot of fish. I remember when we were small growing up. So 
now there's a northern store and you could provide a lot of different foods. To my understanding, it used to be that researchers would come into communities and sort of do their thing and then leave without really giving much feedback to the community members and they would sort of be wondering, you know, what were these researchers doing in our community? The only consideration that was given was the, the charts and the reports and all the written stuff that had been done by the scientists. So we felt that um, making those decisions was totally outdated. It hasn't been good for us and our knowledge base has to be recognized as a legitimate knowledge base and the only way to do that is for both sides to work together. The only way things ever change in a human system is if the humans themselves decide that they want to have that change. The Inuvialuit know that a change is needed, the scientists that are working in the Arctic know a change is needed and we're informing the rest of the world about the importance of that and then it's up to the those people to go to their governments and say we have to affect change we have to become more shepherds of the environment rather than consumers of the environment because we want to have an environment to consume into the future we have to have sustainable development not just development uh, but at the same time unless we bring the local people together with these people that are working on these things, then there's always going to be a, a big gap between what people are doing at the community level and what these scientists are doing, so that the Inuit never really get to use the scientific information that it should be available to them, and, and vice versa, that the scientists never really get to see what the Inuit know about climate and the Arctic Ocean and the environment and the living resources that we depend on. Well, cl climate change has the implication to change the way of life as we know it. And it's a global issue. It's not just happening in the north. The north is experiencing change fast at a faster rate than the rest of the world. But I think what happens in the north is a sign of what's to come for the rest of the world. To me, um, to be able to tell short stories is being able to, to connect that. Um, if I was to tell you that over harvesting is going to affect me in the long run, I would say that um, I enjoy we wearing my traditional clothes, my, the fur that I wear, or the animals that I eat. But if you over harvest them, we're going to have to start wearing store-bought clothes and it's very expensive to be able to buy clothing and to me I've always made uh, traditional clothes so to wear the traditional pullover traveling parkie that's made with down is a lot easier to wear than to wear a parkie that's made with zipper so to me I always use examples like that to be able to educate that um, we get geese for that purpose is to make parkies. We use the um, animal skins, but we also eat the animal, like the muskrat. We make fur hats and mitts and clothing with the fur. And uh, to be able to continue working with animals like that, it's very important that we don't over harvest. But we were always told growing up by the family that you can't over harvest animals. Otherwise, they're going to disappear. So to me, it's very important to continue listening to what the elder said. Uh, the Circumpolar Flaw Lead, uh, CFL is the acronym for it, is an international polar year project that was funded by the Government of Canada. The CFL project has 300 scientists from 15 different countries involved in the project. It's organized into 10 uh, units or 10 groups. The biggest group in that 10 is um, an Inuvialuit-led group that is looking at traditional knowledge um, of how the flaw lead functions and how it works. And then we all work collaboratively on a research icebreaker called the Amundsen. It's capable of um, studying everything from the bottom of the ocean to the top of the atmosphere in the physical world and everything from viruses to whales in the biological world. 
and more importantly, the interconnections of these things. So we're interested in how the system operates. So that's why it's called the circumpolar flaw lead system study, because we're interested in how the system works. Uh, you know, researchers studying this will, uh, you know, they have a, d a different currency. Their 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 life is an academic, sitting in a you know in a in a university and teaching and and so forth and learning <coughs> through the scientific method about a you know a, a direct phenomenon. It's a, the currency is a little different. You know, there's that furthering of of knowledge through the currency of academia, which is a little different than an inuk sitting in a community who's uh, concerned about the daily living and and and, and life in the community. Um, so uh, you know, I think right there, <laughs> it just sets it up for a little bit of a of a different uh, um, perspective. You know. The Western science perspective has developed uh, a scientific approach to understanding this over a long period of time. And the two of them are quite different, but they're both knowledge systems. They both hold answers to what's really going on. And so the idea of the CFL project was to merge these two things together under this umbrella of two ways of knowing. And that's what we're trying to say to the Western scientists is that if we are going to make informed choices and informed decisions about some of the changes that are happening in the Arctic, we have to take into consideration that knowledge base as well as the scientific knowledge because there is a lot of, uh, there is a big body of knowledge now uh, on the Arctic that is coming from h hard sciences, so hard sciences like from the Western scientific community where they, you know, measure and they use scales and you know, videos showing, you know, how much the my ice has melted within a two or three month period. You know, that's all relevant too, but our people bring the human equation to this knowledge that the scientists don't always focus on. They're more focused on the, you know, the conditions of the environment and, and uh, how the ice is melting and to what degree the temperature is rising, you know, those, but they're both important. I really believe too that um, scientists should be able to listen to what uh, the traditional knowledge because of the changes we have observed. Like one day we told this lady, you can't have your tent there, high water is going to come. And in her mind where she was looking at the ocean, no, that it's quite a, quite away from the beach. And then later she had to re remove her building, her house or her tent to another area. And to me, for a scientist to listen to what we say is because number one, we're observing it. Number two, we're using the animal to eat or for fur. And number three, we be able to know that our seasons are changing and the lifestyle is changing. So we, in order for them to to work with us, we have to be. They have to have an open mind, just as we have an open mind for them. Um, so um, that makes it a really human issue. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not just a, um, you know, a biophysical uh, scientific issue. It's a really, it's a, it's a human story. Climate change, and uh, Inuit are front and center in it, as I said. So, um, so I think you, you know, you can't, you can't help but. Uh, but involve and listen uh, to, to Inuit in that climate change discussion. And I think if you listen to what they have to say, uh, you, you know, you'll, you'll be better off to find some solutions, not just for the Arctic, but, you know, for, for Canada and for, you know, the rest of the, the globe as well. Uh, I think it's, it's important. I really think that uh, being able to tell short stories or legends to be able to uh, have a valuable lesson. One of the ones that I always tell them about is uh, when I first came back from residential school, um, mom was trying to reintegrate me into um, having speak the Inuvialuktun language again. And I'm very easy to laugh. So mom used to sit there and try to teach me. And one day I told her, um, I was going to tell her this and I said it wrong. It was because I wasn't paying attention to the, uh, the whole word, I end up saying it wrong. And the two words that I'm going to say is, Nadjagluk, 
and Nadji Dak. And Nadjag look means to have upset stomach. And Nadji Dak is to have a to have a baby. And I'm 14 years old and I'm talking to my mum and I'm telling I want to tell her that I had upset stomach and I end up saying um Nadji Dak to Ami. That's it, I'm pregnant. And rather instead of saying Nadjak look to Ami. I said it wrong and I started laughing because I realized that I had said it wrong. So to me, when you're listening to people, you have to, to be able to listen to everything that's said and not misinterpret what somebody else is saying. And so one of the legends that I tell my kids is to be able to really listen to what they're saying and how they're saying it. Because to me, by saying the words wrong can promote something that's completely different. Because I wasn't pregnant when I was 14. <laughs> you see, short stories okay, like yeah. that are very important to be able to listen and to say it properly. Well, I think uh, from an Inuit perspective, we live it every day. We live that knowledge every day, and we live the life every day in the Arctic. So we're always there, and we, we experience all the different changes and all the seasons on a day-to-day -day basis. From, for, so from year to year, even if you're not studying something, you know what's going on. So that's part of our knowledge. Like I always tell my kids or I, the people that I talk to, when I learned to skin a seal, I did not learn it from reading a book. I learned how to skin a seal by watching how they cut the, um, how, what areas to cut in the seal to be able to take it off the animal and then flush it and then to stretch it and then to scrape it and then to use it. I did not learn that in a book. I learned it by the cultural people teaching me how to do animals. So to me to say that scientifically people can learn to read and write and do it that way. As we were tell, told as young kids to watch and listen. And those are the two greatest tools that I've always used over the years. Well, traditional knowledge is, uh, you know, it, it, it's very old, the knowledge base that we have as Inuit. And it encompasses our knowing of our environment. It uh, includes our culture and a lot of our traditions, our hunting society and our language, because our language is very much a part of our uh, cultural identity. And uh, that forms the basis of our identity as a people, and that's where the knowledge starts from, you know? It's, I think it's very cultural. It's, it's what you value and what's important to you. And I think, uh, you know, a scientist doing, doing research on climate change issues, uh, like the CFL, uh, or looking at a phenomenon like a circumpolar flaw lead, you know, uh, that's opening and closing and so forth. I think the um, sort of the currency or the interest in, in that and how you would approach it, it, it you know, you can, it's very different. Scientists would approach that very differently than a, than a you know, than an Inuk living in a, in a community nearby. Well, it's an accumulation of what people have learned um, over many generations uh, of living on the land and um, going out on the land and learning through observation, just as scientists do. Um, I think all, the only real difference is that scientists get right into the uh, quantitative analysis, um, you know, parts per million, this type of thing, whereas Inuit learn based on observation and uh, um, more not more hands-on, but a different type of hands-on. Um, you know, working with animals and seeing the change and going out on the land and seeing the change. So um, I guess the difference is in the way that people look at the environment. And um, as you get older as an individual, that knowledge base accumulates. And, you know, in the, in the older days, before there was all these drastic changes taking place uh, with climate change, this knowledge and this traditional knowledge was very, very accurate. And uh, as a people, we depended completely on uh, the knowledge base that we had because it was passed on from generation to generation. It wasn't, an, it wasn't a written history. It wasn't a written 
um, knowledge base, it was, it was always oral. But the oral context of um, our knowledge base didn't diminish the, the, both the importance and the accuracy of, of our knowledge. So for me, I mean, I use, I use the word traditional knowledge very sparingly. Um, because you know, I think you know, I think scientists have a you know a certain traditional knowledge that comes from tradition and handed down and and, and so forth. It's a, you know the, that that exists. Um, you know, from an Inuit side, well, it, it, you know, f for sure that exists. You know, oral tradition passed on for for centuries, and and um, uh, they're just very different knowledges, um, and each has you know some some things to add and, and um, the problem is is the, the Inuit knowledge gets a lot less purchase and uh, a lot less credibility and uh, we don't quite yet know uh, how it can be gathered or nurtured or, or included in decision making you know uh, even at, the, at a broader policy level and so forth so a lot of work has to be done on the Inuit knowledge side of things to bring it together uh, with, with science. The two systems, it, the way it's unfolding right now, it's quite clear to us that there are two key differences between the traditional knowledge knowledge system and the Western science knowledge system, and that is one of scale. So the, the traditional knowledge system utilizes information that comes from the direct use by hunters and fishers using these areas. So it's fairly local in, in its context. It's near the communities and the traditional ranges that people have been using for hunting over you know long periods of time. So they have a very in-depth perspective of the flaw lead in the area where they're used to using it. But they also have a much better temporal perspective because they've been using it for a very long period of time. So they see these changes that have been going on over, you know, multiple generations. You can pass it along from one hunter to the next as you transfer this information from generation to generation. And they have an intimate knowledge of how things work at that sort of time scale of, of daily to monthly to interannually to interdecadal. Yeah, the difference being, you know, is the, the, the scientist, well, how do you know? Well, because I have my measurements here, but you ask an Inuk, you know, well, how do you know? Because I know. Well, I think, uh Inuit have lived uh, alongside the environment for many generations and continue to do so. And, um, you know, they just have a different sort of sense of what the land means to them. Well, science, the scientific process, the sort of the Western science tradition, is a very formalized thing. It's been developed over hundreds of years of, of the scientific approach, and that looks at, um, you know, developing a hypothesis for how something works, and then following a very traditional line of, of investigating that particular phenomenon using uh, very rigorous and reproducible techniques, and coming up with a um, answer to that hypothesis at the end of the research process. Uh, that answer being either you accept the hypothesis or you fail to reject the hypothesis. It's a very formalized thing and people in the Western science tradition learn this through universities. So we're, I'm at the University of Manitoba and we train students about the scientific process and how you use that to investigate natural phenomenon. People from all over the world do the same thing. So the 15 countries in our project, most of them come from universities or government research labs who have been trained in the Western science tradition of how you investigate these things. With traditional knowledge, we have to be able to watch the, the tide. We watch, we observe um, the animals, what time they have their young, what time they disappear. We observe the weather. So we integrate it together both um, with our knowledge and with uh, the scientific knowledge that they need. And the last few years, they've been able to take um, samples of the um, brain to check the, and the behavior of the animals, of the beluga whales. And the scientific um, approach to this has a different sort of perspective on it because of the way we do the science. We're, we're more regional, so the, the study 
this year with the ship covered the entire flaw lead area in the western high arctic it's thousands of kilometers in size but the ship allows us to do that, to go all the way around there. But we only are able to do it for one particular year. So we have a limited temporal component to it. We have a limited understanding of the variability through time. But we have a very good indication of the variability through space. There are different sciences as well, um, uh, from you know the biophysical to the social, and, uh, and they use their... their uh, research techniques and, and, and science. And I, I think Inuit and communities are use, using the scientific method just as much. They're going out day to day and, and sampling. And, and, and uh, if, they, if they bring in game, they will right away um, want to check out what that game has been eating so that they know, because they're interested in that. They're interested to know what, you know, what that uh, whale or, or whatever has been feeding on so that they get an understanding of what it's been feeding on. So um, uh, observation, trial and error, uh, repeated observation. I mean, they're using the same techniques, right? It's maybe not just as formalized and it's not written down necessarily, but the same techniques apply. To me, everything is by trial and error. If I make a mistake with one thing, I try to remember that that same mistake, and I improve. It's the same way as raising children. You teach them something when they're small, as they get older, you reinforce it. And by the time they become adults, they continue imitating the way that I was taught by my mother. My mother told me something, and I remembered it. And then I pass it on to my kids or to my grandkids. And so to me, reinforcing it continues um, working as a team, whether it be um, traditional knowledge, whether it be words that were said, or whether it be scientific information, reinforcing it over and over is how we were taught um, our ed through our education. Because the two most important tools that I always tell the kids they have is their eyes and their ears. I don't know. I. I uh, I view knowledge as, as knowledge, you know. Um, uh, you know, and it's so close, closely tied to your your experience and what you're what you're doing day to day, and and what the opportunities are of observation and and uh, experiences and so forth. That you know, for the for your absorbing and that input of knowledge. What are the things you end up knowing about, you know? And, and so, you know, someone living in an Inuit community, their day-to-day -day routines, their experiences, the things that they, that they internalize, you know, are so different than, you know, a, um, a professor working at a university who's a, you know, a researcher. And it's just the day-to-day -day opportunities to learn different things are really big, you know, when you, you consider those two scales or those two uh, ends of the equation, I guess. I really believe it's important to integrate both skills. Number one, you have to watch and listen. Number two, you have to be able to absorb it. And then some people have to document things to be able to remember what was said. Like if I was to take you out in a land and brought you somewhere, you would have to write east, west, south, north to, tr to travel with us. us we, we travel by the drift, snow drifts, we travel by the sun, we travel by the wind, we travel by the landmarks that we, we um, recognize over the years. So to be able to integrate both of them, I could be able to say, you, this is what, where I took you. We went for a walk today, and that's where I took you. To me, if I was going to say, I went north, I knew where I went. So to you, you document your information. Me, I, I absorb it by watching and listening. Science has its methodology and tradition that, that's fairly formalized, but yeah, there's a lot of gray area between there. People are doing it in different ways and they're innovative and, 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 that's, and that's great, you know. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Russian traditions of science are very different than Canadian traditions. Of, you know, it's, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really a diverse uh, mix out there, and, and it's the same in Inuit communities and throughout the Arctic. There's, you know, different, uh, different
different ways of doing things and therefore different internalizations of knowledge. We started um, the Beluga Whale program um, in year 2000. Every year we, they ask us to harvest 25 males and 5 females, so that way we continue keeping the population healthy by harvesting mostly males. Um, they're yeah. checking for um, contaminants in the beluga whales and what they're doing is they're doing the research and then they're, they're sending us back the information. But it hasn't been written black and white that the, of the changes that occurred. But they are checking for mercury and for different contaminations in the, the beluga whale. And um, so it's been a program that started off with DFO and then we've been working with them. And I've been traveling to different um, cities to be able to continue letting them know that this is a program that we work. Okay, this yep. is uh, Hendrickson Island Beluga Harvest in 2008. Right here we have the annual harvest where people are coming in from the community and they're harvesting their whale and, they're, and then they're beaching it. And then in this section we're taking measurements, the length of the whale, the length of the arms and the fluke, and the length of the baby whale. Here we have uh, the young, the youth working alongside with another scientist collecting blood from the whale. Here they're collecting, they're checking on the brain, they're doing, they're dissecting it and they're going to analyze it. And there's my grandson with um, his rubber gloves getting ready to sample a whale. Here we're collecting the samples of the liver and the blood and the kidneys, the muktuk. And here they're taking it off. The scientist, uh, he's checking for diseases, so he's taking specific parts of the animal. It takes individuals that are committed. It takes people that want to work with others, and it takes teamwork. So I think that if individuals are able to do that, that's really where, you know, where the strength is. People want to, uh, have to want to do it. And it's not so much that the Inuit don't want to do it. Scientists in the past, and it's not so much like that now, um, were pretty resistant to the idea that they could in fact consider something that was oral and not based on uh, real hard sciences, you know. So, but that mentality and that way of thinking is slowly changing. I mean, now we're way from, not there yet by any means, but you can see some, uh, some work that is happening now in that area. Uh, I'm supposed to open a workshop this afternoon. It's called uh, Our Inuit Prisoners of Climate Change. So what I'll be doing is just giving a background on sort of life in the north in the Inuvialuit settlement region, um, sort of what my background in education is in terms of both academics and cultural teachings and learnings. And I guess um, my responsibility will be to give people a good enough understanding of what Inuit in the north are seeing in terms of climate change and uh, how they're adapting to some of that change and then also to create interest and discussion around uh, whether Inuit are prisoners of climate change or not. Creating climate change and how can they be part of the solution? So it's, yeah, that's definitely a tough, tough issue. I think there's been changes over the years, yeah, like more more current than when I was a kid growing up. Yeah. Like uh, I, it wasn't so evident when I was growing up as a kid the changes that occurred, but more so when after I got married we noticed that the the ocean started, the land by the ocean started disappearing. So it was more recent than when I was a child growing up. And the importance of it is that the system in the Western High Arctic is changing so rapidly that traditional knowledge is having a hard time keeping up with it. They can't predict um, ice behavior like they used to be able to, the number of occurrences of extreme events with weather and things. And our research is uh, finding the same thing. We're finding that the rate at which we're losing sea ice in the Beaufort Sea is alarming 
absolutely alarming. And when you think about it from a, a time perspective, this is one thing I like to tell people, is that the sea ice in the Arctic has been there in the summer and throughout the year for at least a million years. So that's way before people even evolved on the planet. We've had sea ice in the summertime in the northern hemisphere for at least that long. Coming up very soon, like within the next uh, five to ten years, we will no longer have sea ice in the northern hemisphere. So we've gone from a system that's been stable well over a million years to one that will become much different than what it was before. Do I think we're prisoners of climate change? Well, prisoners is, it's sort of a, like, yes and no, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, I think prisoners sort of makes it almost like Inuit are victims, which, I mean, you could say in a way we are, but at the same time, climate change is going to have an effect on everyone, and it's just affecting Inuit first because of where we live geographically. So, I think in some ways Inuit are prisoners of climate change. Just look at the geographic isolation, um, the way of life that is dependent on the sea ice, and the uh, the um, biological systems in the environment which are changing. So I think uh, right now, yeah, yes and no, we're sort of prisoners of climate change, but um, I think we're working towards breaking out of that prison. Well, I think it's pretty, it's, it's common um, for, uh, for Inuit to be portrayed as the, the victims. Um, you know, and in some ways, as I, as I said before, you know, Inuit are, are, you know, paying a large proportion of the price of climate change, even though they haven't had a lot of input into the, into the problem. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that, is, that is a reality. But Inuit themselves are, are much more interested in, in the solutions, you know. Uh, they want to be a part of the solutions, and, and there's a lot of Inuit out there that are working hard and, uh, you know, devoting their life to that change. I'm a storyteller. I'm an elder that knows the land and um, how to live off the land and how to be able to teach kids. But as a scientist, I could be, I could take the samples off that, but that uh, I'm limited to where the samples are going to be going. I think probably the best example I can I can give on that give on that subject is is with contaminants. Um, I think it's a really good example for showing um, the uh, the marriage of science and, and traditional knowledge or Inuit knowledge. Um, you know because contaminants these are these are particles that are largely in, invisible you can't see but scientists are getting better and better at measuring them to more minute <laughs> you know. Uh, particles and um, and you can study all, all the different types of con contaminants and where they're located and how they're transferred and and uh, um, uh, what kind of ailments they they give to, to humans or to wildlife um, but a lot of that information is is important but what really gives it some teeth in some respects is when you know you have that information and you bring in uh, local knowledge of a people who are who are uh, so closely tied to the environment that they're you know they're living off the animals that are picking up these contaminants. So there's different ways of um, preparing the beluga whale. You can eat it raw, you can eat it cooked, you can eat it dried. Okay so those are skills you're going to be able to teach the young people and being able to make sure that you don't get botulism. So it's very important to be able to teach people how to hunt. Um, you use the, a float when you're harpooning the whale so there's no losses in the whales when, while hunting. You can be able to teach them how to follow a whale and to be able to m distinguish between a male and a female because most of the men in the, my community, they have been able to harvest males because we're trying to keep the population healthy. 
and it's knowing how uh, the local population use and consume these animals that make all this scientific information real. And bringing those together can really inform you on, you know, do you, um, are, are, should Inuit be concerned with uh, eating a certain cut of meat from a caribou because it has contaminants or it doesn't, you know? It, it allows you to, to make some decisions uh, about food use. Um, if you know from Inuit knowledge that um, uh, pregnant women are, certain, are, are seeking out certain organs or cuts of meat that, uh, that might have contaminants in them, well, then it's really important to know that. Um, but you can't know that unless you're talking to Inuit about their, their food use and their history and their knowledge. So that I th for me, that's a good, it's a good example that, that brings together science and, and, uh, and Inuit knowledge. The two ways of knowing concept is the project. Right. That's what it is. It, that's, we've talked about the idea that traditional knowledge is a knowledge system that is useful in understanding how something works. We've talked about the idea that the Western science approach is a, a useful and, and uh, beneficial way of understanding how things work. What we haven't done is integrated those two things together. And so the benefit of the CFL project and the uniqueness of it is that integration. It's how you put those two ideas together and how you then uh, benefit something that is bigger than the sum of the two parts. So I think you need to, uh, you really need to change policy to change the, uh, change the world. But in order to change policy, you have to have that, that scientific validation which we have now. And I mean, the scientists now are just trying to figure out how fast the change is gonna come. They're not trying to figure out whether it's coming or not. You just see from those predicted ice models and it's scary how fast it's changing. So, um, I mean, the evidence is there. The, the work just has to be done. Yeah, I think it takes individuals to make that change because when I was talking to the students yesterday, I was challenging them to go beyond the status quo and to see how they can sort of break those borders of, you know, this is the way we work together and to challenge each other to go well beyond what they've learned now. Here we're working with the youth, the scientists have dissected it, they go into their tents and they work on it, and then they work together trying to analyze this. And we really encourage the youth. There's um, the, the two youth students there and another youth that was in the island, and there's my grandson. But we involve them because they're showing what they're doing. And this was a group of people that came to the island, and they're all, that was their first time that they were at the island. So this is, we really encourage youth. Not only that, it's an educational process for a lot of both my kids and the kids that came to the island. Traditional knowledge is something that is very valuable in our community because that's part of our background and that's our culture to be able to pass it on to the young people. But today we promote education that they have to go to high school, they have to go to college. I've experienced that in both lifestyles. So to me, um, to be able to say traditional knowledge is um, very important. To me, it's a lifestyle growing up from the time you're very little to learning all the skills that's needed for survival is very important. And to me, to be able to look at it that way and to continue it, giving the information to my kids or my grandkids or to the young people that um, need the skills to be able to survive so our culture can survive.
Yeah.